Well, thanks for agreeing for the interview, and again, congratulations for uh, winning our award of Best Councillor of 2011. Well, well, thank you for your recognition. <laughs> um, uh, absolutely. So, when you were first, um, uh, when you first agreed to be a uh, to become the cabinet member um, in, in Harringay, you uh, insisted that your title would be Finance and Carbon Reduction. That's quite innovative. People don't normally fuse the two things together. Why did you want to do that? Well, I can't claim okay. full credit for that. I mean, I think it really, and the leader here, the, you know, the council, uh, was very clear that I think carbon reduction itself is a, is a massive priority for us. Uh, we were the first council to sign up to the Friends of the Earth Commitment to reduce emissions here by 40% by 2020. Uh, and we've had long state ambitions to be the greenest borough in London. Now, I think that there's probably, I mean, the, the finance portfolio is always quite a senior position. Um, I think it's even more important in the current environment where we're facing something like £84 million worth of cuts uh, from a £285 million base, so £3 in every 10 being taken out of the organisation um, over a three-year period uh, is extreme. And I think in those times it's very easy to see that carbon reduction uh, would disappear. Now I think there's uh, three parallels that I always talk about. I think the first one is um, making sure we've got the resources to deal with it uh, is important. Uh, and many councils have decided to step back from it. We've not really reduced uh, the resource that we've committed to it. We've uh, centralised it into one team. In fact, the whole planning service is now called the Carbon Management Service, uh, which was a manifesto commitment. So, so there's, a, there's a bit of that. The second bit, I think, is about bringing the same discipline to carbon reduction. So I think in the movement, we have a lot of... Um, it feels very ethereal. We're going to save the planet. We're going to reduce carbon. They're all things you can't really see in people's daily lives. And I think what I was quite keen to do very early on was bring the same sort of disciplines that we have in finance with the resources to our environmental resources in terms of carbon. So let's start accounting for it. That's why we were the first council to hold a full carbon council, uh, where we devoted one of our full councils purely to the issue of carbon in the borough. Uh, we talked about and what the levels are. I'm quite excited. We've just had our figures in for last year. We've had a 10% reduction. Uh, from 09 to 010, oh, I think that's right, maybe it's 08 to 09, because there's always quite a lag on that, but a 10% reduction, probably... In, in the borough itself? Yeah, that's our national, wow. national indicator 186 target, uh -huh. which is for borough-wide emissions. Now, probably a lot of that's to do with um, the economic climate that we're in, uh, and I recognise that, but equally, 10% feels well, I'm already 25% uh, of the way there to my 40% reduction. So, so that, that feels quite good. But I think people need to understand what is driving that in a more real and dynamic way. How are we doing? Just as people would want to know, how is my budget doing this year? And I, and I think having that sort of same discipline is the way that we'll tackle it. I think the third bit is about the economic consequences of climate change. Um, and Stern rates that, the Stern report, which I think probably kind of the piece within the UK that government have done in terms of really estimating what the costs are and the reason why this is so important. Because um, at 5% of global GDP if we don't take any action on climate change. Now, if you think that we've just been through a global economic crisis that's taken 1% of global GDP out, uh, that impacted the UK to the extent of 5% of our GDP, you can see that recessions are asymmetrical. They impact different populations differently. And I think given that we're the most unequal borough, the impacts of climate change is a real urgency of us to, to tackle this now. So the, the last piece is to kind of try and make it as an economic and real uh, as, as possible uh, in our agenda. And I think if we do that, then we're more likely to inspire or drive people to take action on it. That seems to be a really important point in terms of on inequality linking to climate change uh, and other environmental uh, issues like air pollution, um, because environmental issues are often seen as a middle class concern but in fact they, they're directly impacting the poorest the most heavily. I mean, I, I think, again, you know, that's our motivation. We're a Labour Council here, and you know, our corporate objective, number one, is to tackle inequality. We have that mission because we are the most unequal borough in the country. And um, what's interesting about the inequality in Haringey is that it's um, very spatially obvious from a west to east gradient. Uh, so you've got Muswell and Highgate in, in the west uh, and Tottenham in the east. And whereas we probably have similar levels of inequality um, to places like Islington or Hackney uh, or Newham, th th it's more pepper-potted. Uh, whereas here it's very clear that there is the west and there's the east. And actually 
it's very bad for community cohesion. Now, what I think one of the big things, one of the first things we did at this carbon report was to put up, and I think it's the one side I'd probably take everywhere, uh, and it shows a map of the borough, um, which has the ward gradients, and you can see where carbon emissions are, uh, whether it's heating or electricity, it doesn't matter which one you use, it's broadly the same. And then you can look at gradients of uh, wealth, and you, they're practically directly correlated. And that, what's interesting is, as you say, it's a middle class issue, and, and those groups were like, it can't possibly be that we're the greatest carbon. Well, we're, we're conscious people, but of course it is, because you know what, what we haven't cracked as a, as a species, to be honest, is how do you grow your economy and not grow carbon emissions? Now, for me, if we can tackle that here in Haringey, because our aspiration here is to raise prosperity in Eastern Tottenham, in Wood Green, um, how can we do that without equally raising carbon emissions is what I see as the ultimate challenge between now and 2020. Um, if we can crack that, and I don't, you know, want for impossible challenges, that feels something is exportable, that will bring jobs with it, will bring growth. So you start to solve a whole load of specific social problems. So there's, a, there's the carrot. The stick for me is what New Orleans looks like now. So 2005, you're looking at New Orleans, and um, the difference between pre and post Katrina five years later is astonishing. So the population in itself is just one quarter of what it was. Katrina and you have a pretty good idea of who's left and who's been able to leave versus those that are left behind uh, when you see that there are districts there that have 60% unemployment so we don't have that anywhere here uh, in Tottenham despite having um, well, the highest unemployment in London as a constituency so, so that feels really specific. So there seems to be kind of two strands there in terms of carbon reduction there's kind of easy wins that make sense anyway whether you care about carbon reduction or not using less power you know um, uh, essentially using uh, cutting waste and then there's investment and clearly so for instance you had a very ambitious uh, plan around solar panels across the borough um, which required a certain amount of investment in order to, to, to happen. How disruptive was the government uh, consultation and change in the fit tariff? I mean it, that? it's been an absolute disaster so um, for us we're, we're on hold um, I've, I've known this question, I've brought the exact figures, but to give you an idea, uh, I think we have something like 453 kilowatts uh, of output ready to go and install, and we've got away something like um, four or five. Uh, so 43, I think we've got actually, something like that across 13 estates. Uh, I mean, we had a massive program, and, it, and it's, uh, you know, I, I hope that the appeal obviously falls in time for us to be able to implement uh, our program. And I think you know the exciting thing for that is we could use those revenues to start to reinvest in our holistic program to recycle it, and that's what we do across all of our activities when we invest in um, car reducing shifts. We use the savings to go on to the next phase of either savings or exploring what else we can do. Uh, so it should become self-financing, and that's where the financial piece comes in. But actually, I think the second thing is it actually ultimately comes down to being able to do the right thing, and I think. My concern about the ideology of the government is um, it always says private sector is the best delivery model. What's interesting about things like the Green Deal, which I think is the big thing on the table right now, is actually a, it is clear a mixed model and a mixed delivery model between private, public and probably community organisation uh, is the best model in order to generate the kind of penetration levels in the market that you want to achieve. And I think being able to do that will be really important that there's the space within the legislation for us to do so and at the moment that doesn't look right so you know again I really hope the government looks kind of hard at these the impacts of its decisions and where it goes because I think the worst thing for all of this is that we're all on a stop start um, business plan that we have to reassess every year based on massive jolts to to the status quo. It was quite interesting listening to the climate change minister uh, Greg Barker um, talk about uh, I mean described himself as a champion for decentralized energy and yet the only things he seems to have done so far is to make decentralized energy more difficult to achieve um, but he was very clear that he felt that uh, essentially fit was about subsidizing middle class households but in Haringey you 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 were going to roll out I think it was enough to double London's solar capacity is that right well the time and you're going to go yeah. to <laughs> oh yeah not that, not that obviously but, um, but um, those were to go into the, the poorest areas. And go, am I right in thinking those were going to directly benefit those households where they were fitted in those hostels? So, so half our programme is mm. on our social housing estate. Mm. 
and half is on our own corporate estate. So, I mean, part of and actually on our own corporate estate, we had two different delivery models as well within the, within the program. Um, but yeah, we were going to you know you start to tackle things like fuel poverty uh, and work out where the benefit is. And again, the nature of the housing stock in Harringay is we have a lot of single dwelling properties as opposed to lots and lots of tower blocks uh, and flats. Um, and therefore, you know, you could start to give the benefit directly to the householder uh, where we were doing that. Um, as I said, that's not happened yet. I, I think um, I think the accusation on fit is 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 fine. But then the thing that absolutely is really bad about the consultation is where you're a multiple provider like a council, uh, you'll be recognised like some sort of uh, well, it's, very, it's an even more discriminatory fit rate. It's something like 16p rather than the 20p, which makes it even harder to, to, to get out. And I think the issue for us is, I mean, it's right that we have the right checks and balances in public procurement, but actually that's a cost both in time and money for us to be able to get a programme away, um, which a private sector company doesn't have. Um, that's institutional and legal rather than anything to do with efficiencies in the organisations. And, and I think there's a question for... I, you know, I've done a lot of work. The cooperatives, for example, working very closely with them, and you know, I think even people like Avesco and Howard Johns, who's led the legal challenge, for example. You know, you can see that the, these cooperative and community businesses are equally hamstrung by the way the legislation is written. And the worst thing about the fit coming in when it did was actually it was the poorest people that lost out at that time. Whereas I suspect most of the middle class kind of green people had already got theirs away because. They had 10k lying around in the bank and thought, yeah, that's a way to kind of generate a return right now because well, it's, it's on my house. It's a cap piece of capital. It adds value to my property. I get the immediate receipt, uh, and it's probably safer than any bank you can probably find um, on the continent at the moment. So where are you going to go from here? Um, well, we've got. I think our biggest thing we've got our carbon commission, which launches at the end of this month. That's on um, January the 30th. This is our first meeting. It's been chaired by Andrew Sims from the New Economics Foundation. And we are bringing together a whole range of experts. I won't name them all because I'll probably miss one out and offend <laughs> someone. But genuinely, I think we've got some of the best minds within the sustainability movement, within financing and enterprise, within energy production. Uh, we've got some of the energy providers involved, some of the sustainable energy providers involved, Friends of the Earth are involved. Um, and I'm really excited about the challenge we've set down around um, starting to how do we deliver on our 4020, I guess is the first exam question. Um, we've got people like Prashant Basie looking at the, um, the financing model on how, how do we finance this and how do we do it in a way without impacting on our frontline services. We've got people looking at how do we involve the community and engage them. We're looking at creating a meta plan for the future of Tottenham. So how do we reinvent Tottenham given our plans for regeneration there. And that follows very much on the work that's gone in Manchester and creating different zones. Uh, how, do we, how do we stimulate green enterprise and deliver green jobs here because we need another sector of the economy. And again, there's a capacity in the Upper Lee Valley to create 15,000 jobs. Uh, so, you know, we're looking into really meaty issues. And I think uh, often these commissions are just talking shops and say, oh, there's a bit of an issue here. But really, I'm very hopeful to have real practical solutions that set out the ambition we have to not just reduce carbon, but, but in, in, improve people's lives here in Harringay. Uh, so that's the next big thing. Uh, the thing after that will be the Green Deal, where, again, I'm deeply ambitious for, for a council-led and enabled programme. Uh, where we use the trust, trust in the council brand, so to speak, uh, to work with other providers and other people who've got capacity and capability to go and deliver, uh, both on um, well, tackle things like fuel poverty, actually ultimately to also generate revenues to to start delivering quite a high intensity uh, level of reduction. I think just to give you an idea as well, I mean it's you know 50% of emissions here in Harringay come from residential properties alone, which is quite unusual, quite unusually high. So to take out 40% of that 50% will go quite a long way to achieving our target. Now we estimate that the Green Deal at high penetration levels with a council-led activity, we could get to our 39% kind of emissions coming out of, of our residential base. Extremely high level, extremely high proportion of it. And I think if we don't have a council-led program, you, you start to see penetration levels that just meet nowhere near that kind of level of, of reduction. So, so the added value that we can add as a council is, I guess, trust. Uh, and confidence to make sure that people understand it's bona fide and it's benefiting them and benefiting our borough. I don't think uh, I'm wrong in saying that Harringay is pretty much leading the way in London in terms of councils and some of the other councils, even Labour-led ones, and they don't seem to be taking the same kind of level of initiatives. Quite often they're quite piecemeal. Um, there's, a, I think there's probably no council that doesn't take some sort of 
uh, on paper action around climate change and carbon reduction. Um, but what what do you think in Har those councils should be learning from Harringay? What you're doing, trying to do in Harringay? I mean, I would genuinely say there's a lot we learn from each other. Um, I think. What's different about Haringey is, as I said earlier, uh, other people have halved their their departments um, and looked at an area to cut back on, um, and we've kind of maintained the status quo and increased our ambition. And I think what we deliver in terms of, I guess, what we're calling council and value for money uh, for us with our resources is is unbelievable. Uh, and I'd I'd be honest and say we're, we're at this stage we're packing above our weight. Um, but I think that really just comes from how seriously do you take climate change? And I'd say, you know, geopolitically, cities have to lead the way on climate change, um, especially when you count it. A lot of those emissions are coming from transport. Uh, so it's fair and it's just that cities are taking a greater burden, particularly developed cities like London, um, rather than the rural areas, because there needs to be some recognition that we, are, well, we need to have a rural economy. Um, then there's a second question of how urgent is it, and if you imagine it's something we can wait till 2060 to deal with, rather than 2016, uh, then we're in for a very bad future in terms of how far temperatures will rise, the actual economic costs that we will pick up as councils, uh, and it feels very short-sighted now. Though once you set those reasons, the beliefs behind them, then I think you can only be forced to take action. Um, I'm not sure at the moment in terms of the economy and austerity being as high as it is, that people aren't really looking at something that's also an equally, if not more significant deficit in terms of our excessive use of carbon uh, that we've borrowed. And it's not a debt we can repay. Um, I think climate change is still very much a Cinderella sector. And I think whenever I talk about it, very clear, it's therefore it's part of a mainstream economic agenda. Uh, it's a mainstream economic challenge on inequality. Uh, and actually there's a benefit in terms of a mainstream agenda on economic growth that unless we seize that opportunity, uh, as a country, as an area of London, as a region, um, then you know other nations will, will be producing those and those jobs and products elsewhere. Talking about learning from other councils, your neighbouring Islington Council has just gone 20 mile an hour uh, mm -hmm. on all the roads that it controls. Yeah. Are there any plans to, to do the same in Harringay? I mean, I don't look after transport, mm -hmm. uh, and it's something we've looked at a lot here in Harringay. I, I think our concern about it all is actually, on average, our cars go 20 miles per hour anyway. So whether you really because they're stuck in traffic. Yeah, the roads are you know the roads are congested, and because that's rough, that's the average speed that people will drive through the borough. So actually, introducing a 20 mile per hour zone, I'm not sure would deliver the emission savings that people would say it would because you're not really going from a 30 or whatever you say the speed limit is down to a 20 you're going down from what speed limits are now to what they are now and uh, I mean you know if you look out down there then you know it gets pretty stationary at this time so the average speed limits to the borough are, are, are really very low uh, as it is anyway uh, where they're not very low uh, I wonder whether it's, it's because there's not very much enforcement anyway uh, and there's a cost involved with that so the cost of getting out of 20 mile per hour zone versus the real benefit is really key. And obviously, it's concerned about other things like child safety as well. Mm -hmm. And we haven't used 20 mile per hour zones where there's a really strong case for it. But I think in terms of slapping down a borough wide, I can see that they're very popular. But in terms of the actual benefits, uh, I've, we, we've yet to be convinced of the investment and the enforcement that would be required versus the actual saving that we come. So one last question: If you knew now what you uh, what you what you know now when you got elected, what would you do differently? What would you... In terms of... Well, I don't know. I mean, mistakes you've made that in hindsight you could have avoided. I would have got my solar panels out a lot quicker. <laughs> uh, I think it's the key thing I would have said. So I think we built a very kind of straw man business plan, if you like, based on getting our panels away, using a very small amount of revenue to start up a seed organisation. Uh, I mean, I have no desire, and I should be really clear, I do not believe that councils themselves will deliver that 40% alone. Um, it's very status and very centralist for us to be able to, to be saying that. And I think we're there to fix what is ultimately a market failure uh, and to intervene until the market will take hold and, and deliver itself and it becomes peaceful, people's normal, people's normal behaviour. We've seen that bit in recycling, uh, and we'll continue to see that in recycling. But I think that that's our clear role. I think we needed that bit of kind of room to do it, and I think my my biggest regret probably wasn't doing that. But having said that, uh, when we've done the feasibility studies, we wouldn't really have had that much more time uh, at all. But I think I'll probably look back on the term and say that's my biggest regret is 
Uh, unless, the, unless the appeal uh, is rejected, then I expect that might be my biggest regret. Other than that, I think, to be honest, and I, I would say, you know, this has been a day one priority. It's not like we've started our plans. The carbon commission we came up with in June uh, of 2010. Uh, it's just taken this time to, to, to get it together and to get the quality of people that we want because we want to do it right. Um, so, yeah, I'm, at this stage, very few regrets, I'd say. That's a great note to, to finish on. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks for your time.